Good evening. I'd like to welcome everybody to the March 21st meeting of the Board of Josie of Smith Vocational Agricultural High School. May I ask for a call to order, please? Mr. Kaling? Present. Dr. Spencer Robinson? <coughs> Mr. Quadro? Present. Mayor Ciara? Present. And Dr. Pearson Campbell will not be in attendance. May we all stand for a pledge of allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, mission statement. Uh, Smith Vocational Agricultural High School is to prepare students for social responsibility, employment, and post-secondary education through rigorous applied technical and academic programs. Thank you. Is there any participation by the public this evening? Hearing none. Participation by the trustees. Uh, we have a guest with us tonight. And I'd like to ask Dr. Lincoln Walker to take over. Sure. Is that Cook? Yes, it is. Oh. Welcome, Ms. Behrman, to, to fill in a lot of the blanks. Uh, on behalf of the trustees, uh, a few months ago we were talking, and, and I know Crystal was uh, suffering from, from some major depression upon uh, <laughs> Mr. Cook announcing his retirement from the city for how many years as, as the city's procurement officer, uh, which when I came to Smith, I had no idea what a procurement officer does or what he or she would do. Um, and in this role, I think as a vocational school, more than a traditional school, the amount of spending that we do to maintain our shops. And uh, you know, under the, the previous state administration, under Governor Baker, with the skills capital grants that we've been receiving since 2014, uh, when we're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars with the grants, and you know, we're talking about some major ticket items to support the students, there's one individual in the city that would sort of guide Crystal to make sure that we're following all the rules. Uh, oftentimes we would ask questions, why do we have to follow such rules? But uh, that's why Joe is there to protect us as a school, protect the community, and uh, always make sure that we did the right thing uh, and followed the process. And through that, we never had any issues. Um, and then it's just exponentially even more important, you know, post fire, and now we're talking about uh, you know, seven point something million dollars that we received uh, in grants uh, just this one calendar year. And all of that money has to be approved uh, and it goes through Joe's office. So just an invaluable asset to the city, an invaluable asset to Crystal. Uh, and I just want to personally thank you uh, for, for the role. Uh, you're already sorely missed and you've been gone for how many weeks? Two weeks? Um, so thank you. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we don't have what we wanted to give you this evening officially, but I'm giving you my, my, just my praise. I want to do a photo op, but tomorrow night you're going to be here for our advisory, so expect something tomorrow night. Oh, okay. And uh, you. hopefully you get a tour and you can actually see firsthand uh, your work. That would uh, be actually in place. awesome. So, uh, so thank you. So Crystal, if you want to... You know, I, I just know Joe's always been my right-hand person, and I, I'm sure I can speak for Tim Smith as well. Um, just our go-to and always was quick with an answer or a solution to help us get through some of some of these obstacles. And, you know, it's it's led in my time here, um, we've always had perfect procurement audits. And to me, that speaks volumes because it's what he's taught us and, and just moves us forward to make sure that we're doing the right thing. So um, I so appreciate it. As Dr. Spencer Robinson said, there, you're the infamous Joe Cook. We, we hear your name all the time. <laughs> <laughs> never see Usually followed by something uh, inappropriate, <laughs> like the Wizard of Oz you know, behind the curtain. Uh, I, there's no reason for me to know who you are. I think in the role that I have, and yet um, because of what Crystal just said, I, she holds you in such high regard. And I, I think the word amazing always precedes your name when she's talking about you, and quickly followed by, I don't know what we're going to do with that one. Well, thank you all very much. It's uh, it's really appreciated. Uh, it's been a delight working with you all, um, Crystal and Tim Smith. You know, are the two people I've worked with the most here, and they've always been you know, very cooperative in in wanting to do things the right way. And that's half of the battle is just you know having the attitude that you know we've got to do things the right way. We're spending the public's money. We've got to do it openly, fairly, competitively. 
Um, and they've always uh, done that with good cheer, even when it's, you know, they're up hard up against a, a, a deadline to spend money that we, you know, still all, always manage to get it done and always had a clean bill of health. Um, sometimes we go above and beyond what the law requires. Um, and Crystal was part of that recently, saved us $13,000 by finding an error in a, a bid on a major piece of equipment. Uh, so it's things like that that make us, you know, just a little bit above perfect. I would <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much. I really appreciate your, uh, your time and attention and uh, keep up the good work. Thank you. Did you want to come down for a little photo op? If you don't sure. mind? Debbie, you want to take a picture? Do you want to be in a picture? Chris, you want to take a picture? Not sure we always gave you such an easy time on the city side. There are some challenges. But you kept us on the street narrow for a very long time. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I'll be out there in a second. Oh, wait a minute. Is he good? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be out in a second. So. Okay, we're good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, by the way, where it's uh, from the skirt and where it's my chest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. That was always our tag box. Did y'all cut her check yet? Be here a little early and see if you're seeing Okay. So, that's good. Um, <clears throat> tonight I'd like to provide a very brief update on the Collaborative for Educational yeah. Services as required of school committee representatives. Um, CES holds a statewide contract for the education of students who are with the Department of Youth Services and also the contract for special education in institutional settings. There are about 1,200 students served by 200 teachers. Um, yesterday, CES held its annual Healing Racial Trauma Conference in Norwood, and I was able to attend most of it. I was inspired by the keynote speaker, Hassan Davis, and by the packed ballroom of educators who were there to improve their practice and the impact they have on a very important part of our state's student population. Thank you. Mr. Quadrangle? Uh Yes, I'd like to uh, personally and on behalf of the uh, Board of Trustees thank uh, Crystal Airman and Tim Smith for their tireless work on our two main projects we're trying to move forward. Uh, first of all, the we're going to be moving forward with the OPM Owners Project Manager for the Horticulture Building and also um, a new development with the, uh, what I'll call the canine grooming and kennel area, the pig barn that's going to be demolished and replaced with this canine grooming and uh, starting to move forward on both those projects, so thank you. Thank you. I'd like to uh, address the uh, personally of Irish heritage. The uh, I've spent the the last uh, I put two weeks in the last four days of uh, celebrations that between attending breakfasts and and uh, seeing the High Kings and Celtic Storm at the Academy the other night, and uh, so uh, the mayor and I have seen each other quite often between. Uh, the trustees attended the St. Patrick's breakfast at the Hotel Northampton. The mayor's uh, birthday, we wanted to uh, wish the mayor a happy birthday. Thank you. <laughs> but also as part of that celebration, uh, yeah. one of our students, Jacob Ferdo, uh, received an award from the St. Patrick's Association, uh, which is called the Chanticleer Award. And what that means is storytelling. And uh, they had quite a few uh, young students uh, put their names in to get this award, and he was awarded it. So, not only did he uh, get an award at the breakfast, he got a sash, and he actually marched in the parade. So, he represented himself in Smith Vocational. The other thing that I was involved with the criminal justice group that had, I believe, 18 students that marched, 
and uh, and the cruiser, and we made television. That's the first I think that that's ever happened that we get on the TV. But uh, a lot of good PR for the school. A lot of comments on the sidelines of people saying, "Oh my God, that's a high school with criminal justice. That's awesome." And uh, state troopers, uh, local police that were involved gave us recognition as well. So uh, I just want to thank those students that froze, like the mayor did, and others. Uh, it was a cold day, and uh, so but we 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 persevered again, and uh, so I just want to mention that and get it on the record. Thank you. Um, at this point, may I have a motion and a second to approve the minutes of February 14th Board of Trustees meeting? So motion. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 At this point, I turn it over to Andy for school spotlight. Yeah, and this month, we'd like to introduce Mr. Laro to give an update on our athletic and corporate, uh, cooperative employment programs. Thank you. The logo looks sharp on that corner. The logo looks sharp on that corner. Thank you. All right, I'm going to start off with co-op. Um, uh, Co-op, the last two years, has been very challenging. Last year, because we were still really in kind of in a, in a height of COVID, just coming out of it, it was challenging for kids to come back to school, get their grades up, and become eligible for co-op. So the last two years have been really um, difficult on myself and Mr. Bianca and Ms. Rodriguez because there's a lot of kids that want to go to work, but they don't meet the qualifications. So there's been tons and tons of, of um, discussions um, Joe sat down with myself and Ms. Rodriguez, um, and we came up with this uh, flow chart that you see that I'm going to go over, um, because there was a lot of discussion amongst teachers, uh, people in industry, people that are out in the area asking questions, how come it takes so long for a student to get out, and how come some students get out right away? So again, because of the COVID and the kids not having the grades, we had to figure out a way to um, make the appeal process known for everybody to, to know how it works and how it's go how it goes about and it actually stalls a student for multiple weeks before they can get out so um just to give you an idea this year alone just in february and march joe and myself has have sat down for 26 student appeal meetings that's just february and march okay some of those have good outcomes because we hold them for a few weeks, they do what their ex the expectation is to, that we ask them to do, and then some of them don't do it, we have to hold them. We still have about four or five that are still in limbo. Um, but this chart, Joe worked on it, he sat with uh, Ms. Rodriguez and myself, we talked about how we go about the process. Joe created this, did a great job with it, implemented it, he rolled it out at the teachers meeting. Now the teachers really understand what happens? Why is it taking Johnny three weeks to go out when the other kid went out in a week and a half? All right? It's a really good uh, explanation of how kids go out and how they get stuck. So at least you'll have that. If anybody's asking you out in the community what's going on, at least you can have that information for them. And the teachers really, really thought it was a good thing. And when Report Kids came out first trimester, we had some students, again, struggling with grades a little bit so you look on page two so we also sat down created this form so students that are not under the eligibility and we're not going to pull them off call because they're not failing but they might be grades have dropped we're asking them to fill these sheets out weekly so we can track them so that we don't lose them and they lose credits and then we have to pull them off call and then they're struggling especially the seniors if it's a core class and they need it for graduation so this has also been implemented this year. And then last week, or a week before, we finally came up with our, our, the first sheet that you see, all right? Because there's questions on how do they get the first sheet to go on a co-op? So right now, if a student's interested in going co-op, all the, the teachers have this, the both teachers have this, they can give it to the student, 
The student fills out the top part and then they bring it directly to me. They don't go see Ms. Rodriguez looking for a form because on that form has a lot of information that she creates all the state forms on and then kids either don't get that filled out and then they get stuck in that track. So there's a little disconnect there. So then I go in, I sit with Ms. Rodriguez, I check all these boxes and as soon as I sign this and I give this to her, then she starts creating paperwork. So it's a lot smoother process, all right? Um, so I know there's a lot of questions, but I'm going to kind of go over co-op this year. This year is a very high rate, even with all of these problems. This year is the first year right now we have 80 students on co-op. We have never had that many students out. It's usually between 50 and 60 kids. So the breakdown right now is that there's 27 11th graders out and there's 53 12th graders out. So and I have a breakdown of all the shops just so that Deb can and, uh, you know, put it in the minutes if she wants and I'll give it to her. So there's four horticulture students out, 15 plumbing students, five auto tech, 11 electrical, three culinary arts, three cabinet making, eight carpentry, five ag mech, seven ag science, three auto collision repair, um, six health assistant, five uh, advanced manufacturing, and five criminal justice. All right, so when you hear the criminal justice, that's big this year for us. Um, the fire department's been taking kids, and the police department, and both the chiefs love the kids. Chief Davin can't rave about the two kids he has. He has one automotive student that's training with the one person that works on all their equipment there, and they love them. And then they took another kid on that's on, you know, doing the EMT and um, we had Pensavi there uh, that was a graduate a few years ago. They love those kids. And some of them are in the internships, but they're turning into jobs once they turn 18, um, especially the ones that are at the dispatching. So it's an internship. As soon as they turn 18, they're getting paid. So it's a really great uh, thing that the kids are getting in there. Um, and, the, and the students are all over the place. There's so many new different spots this year. The ag department has never had that many kids out between all the ags the Ag Science and the Ag Met, they've been dragging me for hour and a half rides to go check, up, check out co-op sites. I mean, the kids are everywhere, uh, and they're doing great out there. So the department heads are doing a good job reaching out and finding new, new places for the kids to work. Um, and it's just 80 kids is a lot. And I, I feel that by the end of the year, they'll probably be close to 100 because Joe and myself have four or five more in, in the track of, of the appeal. And then poor cards are going to come out in another week or so. And then the kids that weren't eligible to go out for the first bite at the apple are going to go out now. Um, so I, I can't see why there would be almost 100 kids out. So it's wow. it's been challenging, and you know it's rewarding for our kids. And we're you know they're all over the state, which is great. I mean you know they're everywhere in our districts. So it's been working out great. Anybody have questions on any of that? Well, I want to thank you, uh, yeah, excellent job uh, for doing all that follow up. Thank you. Your and this is, uh, and thanks, so Mr. Bianca as well. And super Mr. clear. Appreciate. They do a lot of the legwork as well. Um, super helpful having this be so clear. I know with my own. The chart was a great. It was a great idea to sit down yeah, and lay that the green, out. Um, the green and yellow and yep. red, like that. That's anybody yeah. can see. Like, oh, I need to be in the green, and if I head, yep. if I'm in the yellow area, there's I'm going to slow down, and something needs to happen. And it's also me. posted on our website now on the yeah, career and technical it. education, so the parents can see it. And then I've been in, me and Mr. Bianca have been talking, and he feels like we should possibly maybe, to hit the parents a little bit more, maybe I should create a couple of Zoom meetings throughout the year prior to kids becoming eligible. And then parents could log on and have a live Zoom, and we could talk about it if they don't understand it. So we're going to move forward with that and uh, see what we can create. Maybe the, on the back of this sheet that the parent has to sign, you know, mm -hmm. this could be photocopied to it. And then when the, so if my son was handing me this that I had to sign, I could just turn it over oh, and yeah, back. Oh, yeah, that's a good process. idea, too. Yeah, so when they go home with that first sheet. And I'd be able to support that. Yep. Um, I wanted to ask maybe Mandy a question, uh, if you would be comfortable answering. Uh, the general question is about the impact on shops, because I know on the one hand, it creates space in a shop, which is probably not a bad thing, and there's a better um, teacher-student ratio. But on the other hand, you lose the leadership of the older students. And so, um, Mandy, I wonder if you could talk about your experience a little bit, if you're comfortable doing that. Like, um, 
as an underclassman when I lost my underclassman? Yeah, just what, what it's like in the shop when they go out on, on co-op. Is it, does it make you excited to think that you can go out to have the opportunity? Do you feel like there's, um, there's kind of a hole with the students missing? Do you like getting more attention from the teachers? Um, it's definitely a mix of both, yeah, like, it is kind of cool to see them go and, like, be able to get more attention from teachers, like, more one-on-one, -on -one, because that way, you know, we learn more. But, yeah, it's kind of, um, like, uh, negative-wise, because, you know, uh, they're also, they sometimes come back, like, as a mentor, and, like, a teacher of a sort, so, like, it's, um, kind of things when they go out, because, you know, let me lose that, but, I don't know, I think the positive though outweighs the negative. So what grade are you in? Uh, right now? Yeah. Well, grade, yeah. So have, are you out on co-op? No, no. And what made you decide not to go out on co-op? Um, I figured, like I could right now, but I just figured um, I could take these this time to like learn as much as I could. You know, like money would be great, you know, getting a job. But, you know, I figured this would be more helpful for the future. For your own future. Yeah. And then you get to be that mentor of the Understood. Yeah. Thank you. Great question, Dr. <laughs> it really was. So I'm just going to highlight sports. I, I think we talked in the fall, but I'm, gonna, I'm just going to highlight. I'll hit winter, and then I'll move into the upcoming season now, just so you have an idea. Uh, winter season, um, we got through the season. Uh, I was trying, you know, coming back on co-op. I mean, uh, COVID, it was trying this year a little bit, I will say. Um, students and parents... Um, were a little rough at times during basketball season, but we made it through. Uh, I just feel like that hopefully it'll get better as we go on. Um, but we had plenty of uh, student athletes for all the teams. Um, girls basketball finished up seven and 13. Um, our boys team had a great season. Um, they went 13 and seven. They won the league this year. Um, and they also made it into the vocational tournament um, and they were defeated by Keith Tech. Um, but it was a great season for them. And our wrestling team um, was in a three-way tie for the league. So they had a great year. This year we had almost filled all the weight classes in wrestling except for four classes. So we had a good group of kids this year, which was great. Um, and the coach wanted to highlight a few things. They finished 13 and 10, but that's not just their league. They go away on Saturdays, so they kind of count all that stuff in the tournaments that they go on. Um, we had five... Um, top five team at Western Mass. Um, we had four Western Mass finishers, finalists. We had one Western Mass champion, which will go on the banner in a gym. We haven't had one in a while. That was Alex Martinez. Um, we had one state placer that came in sixth, which was a freshman this year, um, Mr. Mateo. Um, the second wrestler in history to make the top six in the states for the school. Then we also had Forrest McSweeney, which is the third student ever that had 100 wins at Smith Oak. Um, so it was a pretty good year all, all in all for winter. Um, right now, currently, we have just started um, spring sports on Monday. We have 85 students registered in family ID, and that's not including the nine girls. We were trying to get lacrosse going this year um, as an independent JV level. I only had nine girls, so unfortunately it's not enough to try to get it going. So I'm hoping they don't lose interest and we can get a few more for next year and try to get that up and running. It took us a long time to get boys going, but boys have 29 this year, which is great. Um, last year we only had 16. Um, and then the other teams have um, 28 or 29 for each uh, team for the upcoming. So we should be able to support JV and varsity for baseball and softball, which is good. Otherwise the programs don't grow. Um, so we have 94 registered. So I think other than that, you know, we're going to be all right. Things are looking good. Jim, thank you for your hard work. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. So Rick, property school committee, property um, subcommittee property report. Subcommittee report. Um, as previously mentioned, we had two major projects. We got a whole host of smaller projects that I'll let Tim uh, focus on, but I'll, I'll focus on the two major projects. Um, we've, uh, we received proposals for requests for services for the owner's project manager 
for the horticultural building and uh, currently we've made the decision to move forward with uh, the schoolhouse uh, they seem very eager and now we're just at the stage of uh, finalizing the paperwork mm -hmm. to move that forward and uh, that's the first step in getting to move forward with the rebuild of the building that burned down um, as previously mentioned we're going to be the plan is to tear down and build new uh, we do have dollar issues that we still need to work out and um, then the other <coughs> uh, major project would be the uh, the, uh, the demolition of the pig barn building uh, which is going to happen we have that all lined up for uh, April vacation uh, that will be done uh, by associated building wreckers and then um, currently going to be uh, moving forward with Wiles Architects to provide design services for that new building for which will be the canine grooming and kennel area that's what I'm calling it um, I don't know the official name at this point but anyways um, and most of that work uh, we're anticipating to uh, get going this summer the this wilds architects uh, has a good track record in this sort of facility and can produce uh, appropriate drawings for permits and to get Tim and his staff moving forward this summer and hope to uh, have a structure up, not complete, but a structure up for uh, opening of school in September. And then uh, with the hiring, I got to retract a minute, uh, hiring of the OPM for the horticultural project, uh, we'll start um, putting together uh, requests for design services from architects and get that moving forward um, and that's going to be at least probably 18 months to two year <clears throat> process to bring it to completion and so we have uh, we need to get moving um, so I will now at this point uh, turn it over to Mr. Smith in regards to the other ongoing smaller projects going on campus to keep everybody informed. Yep. Um, so one of the jobs that we're going to try, projects we're going to try to get done this summer is air conditioning and seat building. Uh, we opened up the bid package last week um, and B&G Mechanical uh, won that bid. So hopefully, as soon as we can get a contract, they can order material because it's getting material that will slow everything down. Um, so as soon as we can get it done, they can order. Um, I got, I received the um, the layout for the sidewalk uh, renovation. So we're gonna try to start going around a building off the sit down landing and go over the exact plans because it involves part of um, culinary's outdoor dining area. Um, but we'll break it up into different different projects or different um, contracts um, but hopefully we can get started in that this summer too. Um, we did that, put out for advertising to have the duct work clean in A and B building through the ESSER grants that have been done probably since they were installed in 76. So, um, I think that's all. The locks for the, the key card for the... Oh yeah, so we're going to, May 2nd, we're going to walk around with the company and, and walk through that project before we get started on it. Excellent. Safety is important. Thank you. Yeah. Um, the other major thing you might want to touch on, Tim, was the uh, cornerstone getting going at the oh, yeah. Apple storage yeah. area. So we're finally getting started on renovating and structurally repairing the uh, Apple storage, which is across from automotive shop. Um, cows go in underneath it. Um, auto automotive and plumbing and egg mac have storage on top. Shops cleaned them all out last week, and Cornerstone was here yesterday, and they should be back hopefully tomorrow uh, to start doing their demo of what they have to do. For sure, thanks, Kevin. Hi. Hold on. Um, I want to also add, um, we're continuing this discussion on the Smith Farm Fields dog walking area and our issues out there, 
We're starting to formulate a more formal plan on how to deal with this. Um, so that's that's in discussion stage. And I uh, just want to keep it on the radar. We know we need to deal with it, and we need to deal with it appropriately. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a sensitive issue. Um, and let's see, I think... That pretty much covers all the major items. Dr. Julie? Yeah. yeah. Um, can you explain in layperson's terms, um, I haven't had any experience with, the, with constructing a building of this size. How does a project move forward without um, full funding? I guess I guess one question is how common is that? Because maybe it's more common than I realize. Well, the second we, question is how does it actually work? <laughs> Good question. It, it, does, it doesn't work without full funding, in essence. Um, we're, we're, we're trying to work out those details, and, and we don't know the end cost of our project in reality yet. Right. You know, we have an idea. We did a very uh, extensive uh, feasibility study with, with fairly detailed drawings and, and estimate, and with that first uh, attack, well, we don't have enough money. So either we got to find enough money or when we do hire the design team and fine-tune everything, we get it within our, our budget. So it, it's a process. And is it pretty common? Is it more common than I might think? It's a very common process. Okay. It's, it's any project pretty much, Just unless you have deep, deep pockets. Okay. Thank you. Did I answer your? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. So tonight, my my plan tonight is to sort of deviate from the, the typical superintendent's report and uh, actually walk the board through. Uh, an initial draft of the budget, of budget presentation. Uh, what you're going to see tonight is not a line-by-line -line analysis of the budget proposal. You're going to see more of a high level, uh, where are we as a school with our demographics, uh, sort of review our vision in the direction, and talk about some major uh, highlights and slash barriers of this particular budget that we're looking at. Uh, before I forget, I want to thank Deb for giving me a reminder. Uh, just looking at the city bylaws, as a reminder, uh, the Board of Trustees have to approve a budget by uh, the middle of April. We have a board meeting scheduled for April 11th, uh, which is basically the week that it is due to the mayor or city council. I just pose to the board uh, that perhaps we want to look at a special budget meeting on April, uh, April 4th. It's the previous Tuesday, so basically potentially having back-to-back -back meetings, uh, April 4th and April 11th. Uh, the idea behind that would be, uh, you're going to hear, uh, again, some of the high-level uh, issues that we're, we're looking at with the budget tonight. It would then give you a chance to sort of give me some feedback and give me some priorities tonight. I can bring back to the leadership team to sort of fine-tune this particular budget proposal. Uh, I could then present to you a line-by-line -line analysis of the budget uh, at the April 4th meeting. And if you're happy, we can vote on it and we can hand it off to the city a week early which would then allow the April 11th meeting to be a more of a traditional meeting. If there's an issue at the April 4th meeting, uh, and this has happened in the past, uh, where the board wants to have a certain direction or a certain priority net, that would give us as a leadership team that one week to then uh, get back to the drawing board, uh, deal with any of those issues, come back at, at the April 11th meeting, and hopefully for the final approval. Again, getting it to the mayor in time. So I just pose that to the board. If you want to think about it, we can talk about it when we get into the motions. But I just place that on your lap. So with that said, <clears throat> bear with me. I think there's a lot of data. I think it's important for the, the board to understand who we are and where we're at. <clears throat> so we know who all of you are. You know the administrative team for this year. The mission statement, you know, we, we recite every single board meeting. You're familiar with that. Now some student demographics. And again, this presentation minus the actual budget, I, I did share with the staff at a, at a recent staff meeting. I just wanted to, to have them have some input some acknowledgement of what's going on at the, at the school level. So we did review all of this with the staff a couple weeks ago. All of this information can be found on the DESE website. It's all publicly known. 
Uh, this first one is, talks about the enrollment by gender. So boys, girls, and non-binary. And the big takeaway is our enrollment went up about 3.5% this past school year. The state enrollment went up about a quarter percent. And I think if you look in Western Mass, uh, that's probably even more drastic. You, know, you, you talk about the setting districts, especially up in the, the hill towns and up in Franklin County, their enrollment continues to decline. So you can imagine if our sending district's enrollment continues to decline, our enrollment continues to increase, that begins to create some issues between us and the sending districts. Uh, nothing new, but again, I think this slide highlights that fact. <clears throat> Continuing to look at the demographics, this one looks at race and ethnicity. Really nothing much to take away from this particular slide. Uh, rel relatively consistent from one year to the next. Pretty consistent with what the state is looking at statewide. Uh, so really no outliers here when it comes to uh, race and ethnicity. Dig a little bit deeper. Uh, this is some selected populations, our L, our L students, our students with disabilities, high needs. And uh, I'll dig into this a little bit deeper when we uh, do a comparison with the Western Mass Regional Vote Techs. But I just want to point out uh, to the board, I've said this before, if you look at our students with disabilities, nearly 40% of our students have a disability, i.e. an IEP. Okay? The state average is 19.5%. That's a huge difference. Okay? Uh, and, and I shared this with the staff, and again, you'll see this in a future slide. High needs. Almost 63% of our students are categorized as high needs, which is basically taking a bunch of different demographics lumping them together, so because one, one student might be uh, a minority student, might be African American, might have an IEP, maybe low income, so that one student is being counted in multiple categories, uh, we, we bump them all into high needs, that one student is counted once in, in high needs. So the point is, nearly 63% of our students are categorized in one of those categories. Uh, compared to 55%, which I think is still kind of high statewide, uh, but it shows that we are way above average when it comes to uh, yeah, the students that we're servicing here. Yeah, I think we're doing a pretty darn good job servicing those particular students. Low income, I was actually surprised that we were below the state average when it came to students that are considered low income. Last year's graduating class, uh, what did they do upon graduation compared to the state average? Uh, nothing really out of the ordinary for the Smith grads. Uh, we had a slight increase in our work population, the, the grads going off to work. Uh, one takeaway I shared with the staff, and I, I share this as a former school counselor, it's the first time I've seen the state average uh, actually go down at, with the four-year uh, colleges. Uh, it's very slight, okay, it's about a half of a percent, but the fact that less students are going to four-year colleges, I think, is noteworthy. And here at Smith, I think we, we acknowledge that, we actually s sort of Highlight that, you know, we have many doors, you know, our, our motto is opening up the doors for, for the students, and, and there are many other doors that have opened besides just a four-year college, and, and our students know that. It will be so interesting to look at how the pandemic impacted all of this, right? Correct. And we're going ahead and looking back to see, because that probably is a factor as well. Correct. People done with online learning, and, yeah. It would be interesting to see if the numbers rebound or not. Yes. They change at all. I just want to highlight, and again, I think I'm probably biased uh, as a veteran. Uh, the military, we always say the recruiters are always impressed when they come to Smith. We are uh, very receptive to the military, and, and we're not pushing the military necessarily, but again, that's just another door for our graduates to, to pursue. And, and roughly 9% of our graduates pursue the military compared to less than 1.5% statewide. Um, so. I know it's very difficult to see. Um, in your minutes you'll have, have this, but this is a, a table I, I created last year. And it's a comparison of Smith Vocational to the other Western Mass Regional Vote Techs, specifically Franklin Tech, McCann Tech, and Pathfinder. <clears throat> Some points of reference. We have 64 standing communities, okay, give or take. Franklin Tech services 19 communities. McCann Tech services nine, and Pathfinder serves nine. Franklin Tech, like the title, they, they service Franklin County. Okay, uh, McCann Tech is up in North Adams. They serve sort of the, the northern Berkshire uh, region of the state. And Pathfinder serves sort of the eastern Hamden County region of the state, <clears throat> just as a, a point of reference. Other points of reference, we have 15 programs. Franklin Tech has 13, McCann has nine, Pathfinder has, I believe, a 16 now. Okay. Uh, 
Well, I've done here just to color code because I think the colors really jump out at you. Any time that you see a red number, that represents that that's sort of the most diverse. Okay, so typically the highest percentage in that particular category to highlight that whoever has that red means that they sort of have, have a higher percentage in that particular category. The idea is whichever school has the most red uh, is the most diverse when it comes to the Western Mass Regional Book Text. <coughs> and I know it's difficult, but you can probably see the colors. For the most part, Smith Vocational is by far, without a shadow of a doubt, the most diverse vocational school in Western Mass. We have the most non-binary students. We have the most, again, minimal, the, the most, most Asian, by far the most Hispanic population, 13%. The second highest is 9%. We have the highest of, oh, I'm sorry, the inverse, we have the lowest percentage of white students, okay? 80% uh, yeah. of our students are considered white. We have first language is not English, 4.4% of our students, English is not the first language. Uh, the second highest is 0.5%. We have 4.4%, second is 0.5. Big discrepancy there. Same thing with our uh, English uh, language learners, 4.2%. The second highest is 0.5%. Huge discrepancy. Students with disabilities, I mentioned on the previous slide, 39.9%. By far the highest percentage of students with disabilities. Uh, the second <coughs> highest is 24%. So 14, 15% higher than the second highest. Uh, high needs, I already mentioned, 62.7%. The second highest is 55%. Again, discrepancy. And then economic disadvantage, we're actually not the highest, but we're still really, still really close. We're all in the, the low 40%, okay? Um, so I showed that to the staff, okay? Uh, we are the most diverse, and we probably have the highest needs, no pun intended, the highest needs in the population. So let's talk about some achievement measurements. <clears throat> dropout rate. We don't necessarily have the, be the best dropout rate, but we, we also don't have the worst dropout rate. We're right there in the mix. We have the highest graduation rate out of these schools, 95, over, over 95%, and the second highest is 93%. So we have by far the highest population of students with disabilities. We have by far the highest high needs group. We have by far the highest of the, the uh, various racial and ethnic breakdown, yet we have the highest graduation rate, highest attendance rate. That is something to write home about and celebrate. Stu uh, students per, uh, per computer, all relatively uh, the same. Basically, it's almost a one-to-one -one across the board. The accountability percentile, I want to thank, again, Mr. Parks a few months ago, talking about the MCAS scores, <laughs> talking about accountability. And again, the accountability percentile, as a reminder, is a percentile of 1 to 99. 99 meaning that you're the best. If you're in the first percentile, it means you're in the worst. And uh, that percentile is comparing like schools. Now, in the eyes of the state, like schools is not vocational schools. Like schools is all high schools with the same grade span that we have. So because we serve students in grades 9 through 12, they're comparing Smith Vocational to all of the high schools in the state that, are, that offer grades 9 through 12. And we are in the 26th percentile. So again, when Mr. Parks was reporting that out a few months ago, you know, it, that looks like we're not doing a great job. Okay, that means... <coughs> Roughly 75% of the high schools out there are achieving, okay, in quotation marks, at a higher rate than we are, okay? But when you consider the demographics that we had on the previous slide and compare us to the other Western Mass Regional Vote Techs, we're actually the second best. That's and pretty good. MCAS is the biggest driver of that accountability Correct. percentile. And with when you look at percent the, of our students on IEPs who typically struggle with standardized tests like that, that's even more correct. important. So the highest percentile in this group is McCann Tech at the 37th percentile. Mm -hmm. Which again, if you think 37th percentile, that means you're in the below the, the half, okay, you're in the lower half. Uh, but when you're looking at vocational schools, and we're, and we're in the 26th percentile. And the other point I wanted to make, I, I made with the staff a couple weeks ago, are the number of communities that we serve. So as an educator, you know, as a curriculum director, um, it's much easier when you work in a district, when you're looking at vertically aligning your curriculum. If you have one elementary school and making sure that what they're teaching then aligns to what the middle school is teaching and making sure that they're, they're aligned to what the high school is teaching. So those high school teachers have an easier job making sure that those students are prepared for the MCAS. We have 64 different communities, which means potentially 64 different ways to teach the material 
in their elementary schools and middle schools, and then they walk into our freshman and sophomore English and math classes, and our English and math classes are expected to teach to the same test and get those students to that same level, and they do. In half the amount of time, again, that the traditional high schools have. Uh, I think that's just, it's unbelievable. I cannot say that enough, and, and congratulate our staff for doing that. So, questions on, just I, I really wanted to hammer home that we have High needs, yet we are achieving at a high rate compared to the, the like schools in Western Mass. Uh, first, my recognition, <coughs> fantastic. And I, I hope the faculty was super proud with seeing these numbers. What an accomplishment. Um, not a surprise to me at all, knowing the reputation in the community and my own kids' experience. It was just exceptional, um, but awesome to see these numbers back it up. Um, I'm wondering, I'm thinking about the 40% or 39% of students in special education and then 64 center communities. We, we aren't the ones who um, declare a student eligible for special education. That's their sending districts. I, how hard would it be to look at their special education students and where they are coming from, uh, what their sending districts are? Um, I, I'd like to see the, well, the total students that come from each of the seven districts and what percent are on IEPs. Um, just to look for any kind of trends or patterns. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. I, I'd also like to know that for like, the, the Latinos. Is, a, are, is that because, well, because of Northampton or is it because I know that we have students coming from all over, so I'd be curious about that too. But first, the special education. Okay. Now, looking at the enrollment trend, again, this is a slide I, I typically share to show projecting out where, where we stand. So we are currently this year, this is as of our October 1 numbers uh, that we sent to the state, 566 students broken out. And, and again, as a reminder, the admissions policy states that we bring 150 students in every year, which is why we're hovering around the 150, okay, the <coughs> freshmen, sophomores, and dropped a little bit of juniors and seniors. So projecting it out to next year, if we bring in 150 <coughs> students, and assuming that every single student then stays, okay, point number one and two gets promoted to the next year, we just simply carry over those numbers. We will be at 586 students next year. That's plus 20. In parentheses, uh, I know Mr. Bianca is going to share some updated uh, application data in his report, but these numbers uh, were shared at your February board meeting. And I just wanted to, to show sort of a reference point. Uh, as of February, we had 243 applicants for the incoming freshman class. So of the 243, we want to get 150. I know that number's higher. I previewed Mr. Bianca's report. The sophomores, we brought in 151 students. We had 215 applicants last year at the February time frame. Again, most likely we ended up higher than the 215, but I just want to again show the board that we're receiving more applicants than what we're able to accept. And then you can see the same thing for the junior class and then the senior class. Okay, that junior class, that was sort of the height of the pandemic. Uh, and we keep talking about that applicant pool was down a little bit because of the, uh, of the pandemic. Projecting out to the following year, this is when we finally hit our goal, which is capacity, in quotation marks, and we'll talk about that in a few slides, what capacity means. But we'll have, hopefully, officially 150 students uh, in each of our, our grades, which means it's an increase of 15 students from next year. So it'll be another bump in our enrollment. After that, as long as we maintain our admissions policy standards, uh, we'll be then sort of level at 600 students, uh, which has been the goal for the last few years. Which, again, will have a direct impact when we start talking about budget, and we'll get back to that. Historically, for the last 44, 45 years, uh, you can sort of see the trends in enrollment. Uh, so back in the, the late 80s, you know, where we were as a school, uh, when Mr. Bianca and I first came to Smith, we were, you know, in the low 400s, and now, as you know, you know we're up in the, five, the high 500s. As a reminder, the blue is our total enrollment. The red represents our non-resident students. So when we talk about, uh, when it comes to budget, about 80% of our students are non-resident students, which is why when we talk about building a budget, it is so difficult because we're trying to you know, hit this moving target of how many non-resident students can we anticipate to build, and then what is that rate? That rate is not set by the board. You officially vote on it, but you're basically voting on the number that the state releases, which again makes it difficult for us to build a budget. <clears throat> so the vision, this was a, a vision statement that we created a few years ago within our leadership team, 
you know, you've heard some of these these phrases, but you know, we, we do keep this at the center of all the discussions, and when it comes to the budget, it comes to the direction of the school, you know, we want to be that predominant CTE school in ag in Western Mass. You saw the other Western Mass schools. I've already compared us to them. You know who we're competing against in Western Mass. And I think we're doing a pretty good job this far. We're still not the predominant. We're second best. We want to be first. That is consistently at capacity. We'll talk about what that means in, in a moment. Within all capital letters, all of our programs, while providing the most rigorous and relevant educational experience for, again, all students. Not some students, but all students. That's the vision. How are we going to get there? Let's talk about admissions and that capacity. We've talked about this informally over the last couple of years. I just want to again hammer home because it, it will help drive conversations around the budget. We are currently, per the admissions policy, we accept 150 students every year. Once we realize that, we'll be at 600 students. Basic math. Those 600 students divided by the 15 programs that we currently offer means we would have 10 students per grade per shot. Does anybody know this? I asked the, the staff, they were, they were on it. What is our cap in most of our shops? How many students can we have per grade per shop? Anybody know on the board? 12, okay, there we go, okay, you agree to that. So my, the point is, the current admissions policy, if we follow the current admissions policy and get to 600 students, we're already setting ourselves up for not filling every single shop. And we put a lot of pressure on our, our vocational instructors to attract and, and get the freshmen into the particular programs. And some shops fill, and obviously based on the math, not all shops will fill. It's nobody's fault besides just the way that the system is set up at this point. But somebody could say, we are at capacity because we're meeting our admissions policy. Who, but are we truly at capacity? Who set that admissions policy? Who decided that it would be 600 students? 150. Uh, that was, I'm looking at some more veterans. That's a long time ago, I think, was listed. I'm not sure who. So that's up to... The, board. the board's discretion to decide how many students we want to admit. Correct. And the bottom bullet, that admissions policy used to be approved by the state. They used to own the admissions policy. They would approve each school submitting it. They've now changed that. And I, could, I don't want to, my conspiracy theorists, you know, why they've now relinquished the, the, the liability and responsibility of them not owning the admissions policies. You as a board now own the school's admissions policy. Uh, we have to approve it every single year. So that means we can be found liable for violating civil rights. Correct. So that's the current admissions policy. And we talked about this, okay, 600 students, fine. Uh, on average, it would, be, it would be 10 per shot per grade. If we want to maintain the current enrollment of 600 students, but if the vision is to have every single shop at capacity, what would that look like? Well, the answer is, again, 12 students per grade per shop. Okay, with the 600 students, that means we'd have 12 and a half shops full. So you've heard me informally over the last few years say, you know, what two shops would we have to close? I'm not advocating to close two programs. Don't get me wrong this evening. I just want to make it known to the board that that current admissions policy, if we want to truly realize that, that vision statement, we should only have 12 to 13 programs. And we'll get into what that will look like when we get into the budget. So just keep that in the back of your mind, please. This third one is, what happens if we, if we stand firm as a board that, no, we want the 15 programs. We do not want to recommend closing any of the programs. We love every single one that we're offering. Well, how many students will it take to then fill all 15? It's going to take 720 students. Which means that admissions policy would have to be revamped to say that we take 180 students per year. The question is, where do you put them? <laughs> Academically, I look at Mr. Mr. Parks, I'm sure he's pulling his hair out in the back. There's no way we could currently support 180 students per grade, which means 720 students when it comes to the academics. And I'm just going to jump ahead real quick. But you're going to say, that's that 720. This is the same graph that you saw a little while ago. 600, this school has seen 600 students on campus before, back in the, the early 80s. So physically, is it possible to have 600 students on campus? The answer would be yes. However, I just want to remind the board, back in the early 80s, the academic requirements were different within the vocational world than they are now. The special ed laws okay, were very minimal. 
And in the academics that we, the students were exposed to back in the early 80s was very minimal. It was truly your basic math, English, okay, history, science. And now we have just the whole breadth of those. Uh, on top of we offer Spanish and we offer our uh, the AP courses that we want to stand by. Uh, so that requires more teachers. It, more teachers require more space. They don't have that space. So again, that then leads to the conversation of we need a new building. Uh, so, same thing that seat again. So again, this is something we have to cont continue to look at, our admissions policy, and what is our capacity, and where do we want to be in the future. <clears throat> so, moving on. You had the bullet of the lottery system. Can you speak to that? Sure. So the lottery, um, there's many articles out there right now. Uh, there is There are challenges statewide on admissions policies. Um, and the challenge is uh, the selective criteria. Uh, so the selective criteria does follow federal law that we are allowed to have selective criteria to select which students uh, will, will enter a vocational school. Uh, the challenge is that if we choose to have selective <coughs> criteria, the purpose behind the selective criteria is to make sure that we're um, identifying those who could best benefit from this, this, this experience. That's how we are allowed to have selective criteria. The challenge right now is that schools who have selective criteria, we raise our hand, we're one of them, we have to ensure that the selective criteria is not biased against any, any particular population. And if it is biased towards any particular population, we are opening ourselves up to a challenge. Um, so every year, the board decides what they want to do with the admissions policy. As a superintendent, my personal, me, my name, I have to sign uh, a form that is submitted to the state saying that, yes, we are following the selective criteria, and the selective criteria that we have is not biased against any populations. So we have to review that every single year. Um, there is discussion at the state level. Uh, do they just want to move to a lottery statewide? Uh, the supporters of a lottery are saying that it would minimize the bias and it would give all students a fair shot if trying to get into a vocational school. Uh, the challenge is, you already saw a few slides ago, we have more applicants than we have more seats. That gap is even higher in Eastern Mass. We're talking about wait lists of over a thousand students who want to get into a vocational school, they can't get in, there's not enough seats. So the supporters of the lottery are like, that's not fair. Okay, your selection criteria is biased. You're taking the wrong kids. Uh, you can read all the articles. It talks about all of this. Uh, and you need to move to a lottery, like the charter schools. <clears throat> our, our being MAVA, the vocational world, our pushback to that, to the lottery, in, that, in theory, is that the lottery doesn't solve the wait list issue. It doesn't solve that access to vocation. Uh, because the lottery isn't going to create more seats. Okay, so that wait list of 1,000 students will not be solved by in instituting a lottery. All you're doing is reshuffling who's sitting in the seats. But you're still going to leave 1,000 students out. What the 1,000 students look like may change a little bit, uh, but you're not servicing 1,000 students. So our goal uh, to the state level is how do you increase capacity? That means more money. It means building more schools, more bigger schools, buildings. renovations, let's build more seats. And as a superintendent, if I could say no to no one, okay, let's take everybody, that would be ideal. But I think this is a wonderful educational system. If you want it, why can't we offer it? Uh, but we just don't have the seats available. Uh, so that's sort of what's happening at the state level. Uh, if we as a school decide we want to move in that, that's a discussion. Uh, there's pros and cons. You may know the answer to this. You might be one of the only people who does. Um, so a federal lawsuit was brought but against the state, but you just said that vocational schools are in charge, you know the answer, okay, so vocational schools are in charge of their own admissions policies and are liable for them, so, so how the, the, is this group suing DESE in federal court? Because DESE has the regulations that have stated that we are allowed to use the selective criteria, as okay. long as it's not biased. So the challenge right now isn't right now directed at the schools. It's, it's directed at the regulations that the state have, have outlined. But isn't, doesn't that come from Chapter 74? So the federal level and in a state within the Chapter 74 regulations, which are state regulations. Chapter 74 so is state. Chapter 74 is state. Perkins, that's what I mean. So Perkins is federal. Right. So, so it's in per Perkins allows for selective criteria. So are, are there lawsuits in other states? I'm unaware of that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So we already talked about what that would look like, different capacity. Now, 
I know difficult to see. Uh, I, I want to just highlight a couple of things here. Okay, and this is that emissions dialogue we were just touching on. This, what you're looking at, at the top, this is data from last year's eighth graders at JFK. So we're only looking at Northampton data. There were 223 eighth graders at JFK last year who had to choose what high school do they want to go to. They either come to us, they go to NHS, they go someplace else. Of the 223 eighth graders, 71 were students of color, 152 were white students, 72 were considered low income, 151 were not low income. Students with disabilities, 50 students had an IEP at JFK, 173 were gen ed, no IEP. L students, there were 10 students that were considered L, that's English language learners, 213 that were not. That's, that's the, the catchment area of JFK. I, I read through it, don't worry about it. Here's the issue. Applications. 56 of the 223 applied to come to Smith. Of the 56, 21 were students of color, 34 were white. Percentage breakdown. That means 29.6% were students of color, 22% were white. A higher percentage of students of color apply to come to Smith than white students who apply to come to Smith. I've, now, I'll do this slowly across the board. I think this is an important point to highlight. That is telling me that we are we're, we're attracting a higher rate okay, of students of color, which I would, I would question to JFK, why is that the case? Okay? What is happening systemically uh, that is leading a higher percentage of students of color wanting to come to Smith? Okay, that's a philosophical discussion for another day. You're saying they should be proportional to the members. You would assume. Jump down. So we have a higher percentage of students of color who are applying to, to Smith. Those who got accepted, or, or an offer made, okay, an offer made. 71% of students of color were offered acceptance. 94% of white students were offered acceptance. Why the flip? If we had a higher rate of students of color applying, but we have a higher rate of white students being offered acceptance, that's a question. So back to the previous slide talking about admissions policies when the state says, you can have a selective criteria as long as it's not biased. Somebody from the outside could say, okay, Smith Vocational, why are you uh, offering at a higher rate your white students than your students of color? Just posing that question. Okay. So question number one, why, are, why is a higher rate applying? Okay. That's a good thing for us. Maybe it's a question for Northampton. The question for us is why are we not accepting at the same proportion rate? Low income. 55.6% <coughs> of students were low income. 55, I'm sorry, 55.6% of low income students in Northampton applied to come here. 9.9% of non-low income students chose to apply here. That's a huge discrepancy. So why are the low income students in the city of Northampton <laughs> wanting to apply to Smith at a higher rate than the non-low income students? And I begin to say maybe there's a class issue within the city. I oppose that, that's what the data is telling me. But, the next sentence, down below, the acceptance rate. We have such a large percentage of low-income students wanting to come here, they apply. Only 80% of low-income students were offered an acceptance. 100% of the non-low-income students were offered an acceptance. It flips again. So the question is, citywide, why are more low-income students wanting to come here? But then the question internally, why are we then accepting all of the non-low-income students but not all of the low income students. Like we're perpetuating that bias that you're noticing at JFK. Potentially. Next one, students with disabilities. Same trend. 48% of students with disabilities applied to come to Smith. Only 17, almost 18% of gen ed students at JFK decided to apply to Smith. So again, <coughs> chances are if you have an IEP, you apply to Smith. If you don't have an IEP, you go to Northampton High. Question is why? I think that's a fair question to ask within the city. 
<clears throat> but when it comes to offers made, it flips again. 75% of students that have an IEP that applied received an acceptance. 93.5% of non-IEP students that applied were accepted. Again, it flips as a gap there. Our L population whoops, is actually the, the closest gap. 50% of L students, granted the number is small, five of the 10 L students at JFK decided to apply to Smith. 23.5% of non-L students decided to apply to Smith. Again, there's a narrative. If you look at who's applying to Smith from JFK, there's a narrative that's being written across the board. If you're in one of these subcategories, maybe you should apply to Smith. I think that's a question that we should talk about systemically. However, when you're in those subgroups, you're being, a, uh, being given an acceptance letter at a lower rate than if you're not in that particular group, which is an internal discussion that we have to have, and we're beginning to have that within the leadership team. I know it's deep material, it's, it could be a sore subject, but that's what the numbers are, and those are the numbers that the state is sharing with us, which is why the opponents of a selective criteria side, like C, Andy, okay, uh, if you just get rid of selective criteria and do a lottery, then those numbers change. My pushback to the state has been, we have, you saw the previous slides, our, our low income population, our uh, special ed population is so high compared to the state average, chances are those numbers will come down. Um, the supporters of the lottery don't care about that. Um, they just feel that we're being biased based on the select, selective criteria. And I would say that based on this one year's worth of data, there's a sound argument that perhaps it is biased. So, I'm not ready to make a decision, I'm just sharing with the board. There's one school, one vocational school in Massachusetts that went to the lottery? One and a half. One and a half. Yes. And what has their experience been? Uh, minimal change. Uh, so the one that went to a lottery is, they call it a conditional lottery. Is that acid? It's acid. Uh, so you had to meet minimum criteria, and then you were put into the lottery. Uh, their numbers didn't change a whole lot. Uh, back to what I just said, it, it, it doesn't solve the problem. And then another school chose a, a very small group of their applicant pool, I mean their acceptance pool, was, came from the lottery. Okay, so a lot of this, now we get into the nuts and bolts, uh, before we get into the budget. Curriculum instruction, we've talked a lot about our uh, the animal science concentrations, how we, we want to become the true Aggie, which means we want to offer all the, the concentrations within, within animal science. And when you look, uh, listen to Mr. Quadro and, and Mr. Smith with all the construction that's going on down back, is to, to realize this vision. Uh, once we're done, we will have that containment animal concentration. We can then look, begin to look at the vet assisting in the equine concentration. So we're moving in that direction. By focusing on animal science, it does allow us to align to our, the, the true mission of the school you know, with, with Oliver Smith. Uh, it's in the school's name as an agricultural school. We're the only ag school west of 495. We might as well be truly the ag school west of 495 and offer all of these concentrations. By increasing the number of concentrations that we're offering, there's no official new approval pro, uh, process at the state level. We already have the program. It's called Animal Science. We can begin to build the enrollment by offering those concentrations. So it's a much easier, more efficient way to increase enrollment without going through the rigmarole at the state level. <clears throat> the horticult horticulture, they also have they're a program that has many of these concentrations. I do know at the state level, uh, the state's been focusing on animal science, they've been focusing on these concentrations. What is next on their docket is horticulture. And uh, the, the potential is that they're going to break out the horticulture concentrations into <coughs> separate little sub-programs. Because again, if you think as a teacher, some of the concentrations within, within horticulture, you've got arboriculture, we call it forestry, you've got the greenhouse management, you've got the landscape uh, management, uh, flor floriculture, what, what am I missing? Greenhouse? Is that a concentration? Yes. Uh, so there's, there's many concentrations that if you're out in industry, you might be a, a forester, but you're not a florist. But we're looking for a teacher to teach horticulture that knows both of those particular concentrations. So it, it's next to impossible to find that truly well-rounded instructor. Uh, and again, as we expand those programs and expand our enrollment, we begin to get into the need for more academics. Again, that's where if we, if we chose to try to move to that 720, 
We're going to then make a very strong case that we need more academic classrooms. Where we're going to put that, that's why we need a, a new D building. Okay, so it's baby steps to, to get to that vision. Staffing, this is over the last few years. I just want to remind the, the board, uh, we have been moving and taking leaps and bounds trying to, to increase our staff. I want to thank the board for financially supporting that. As a reminder, uh, we increased history. We increased uh, in the English department. A slight modification, okay? Uh, looking again at the data, we have a higher percentage of L students. So we, we increased our staffing, but that <coughs> staff person, along with some para-support, uh, is able to support not only English, but also our L students. <coughs> so we're able to accomplish that. PE, uh, we hired additional PE. On the vocational side, uh, we're finalizing the animal science teacher that we posted for this year. Graphic communications remains out there. Uh, that's our vision, is to have two teachers in that particular program, uh, and we will do that someday, okay? Uh, but it hasn't happened quite yet. Carpentry, uh, we were, thank you to the board, we hired that, that fourth instructor, it's the second instructor in carpentry. We were able to accomplish that this year. Administratively, the main biggest ask that we're asking for this year is a second assistant principal. And I shared, just a side note, in front of the staff in the back, when I shared this with the staff, probably the first time I ever got a round of applause from the staff, <laughs> is when I announced that we're asking for a second assistant principal. So I think that speaks volumes, okay, that we all recognize the need for that support at that level. Uh, I, I think that the climate, the school climate, has improved over the last eight or nine years, and we want to maintain it at that high level. I think if you look at the pandemic and the fallout of the pandemic and just the, the lack of civility uh, amongst the students and amongst you know, adults at times, uh, having that additional staff person at the administrative level will go a long ways in, in ensuring that, that that positive school climate remains. So that's what will be in the budget. I also, I do not want Mr. Smith to retire anytime soon, okay? But not an if, but a when that day happens, okay? Uh, I want to be prepared to divide that position into two. Right now, Mrs. Smith somehow is accomplishing two full-time jobs within one human body, and it's next to impossible. He is actually the facilities director and the farm manager. So when that day comes, I want to propose to the, uh, to the board that we split it and we'll have a facilities director and a farm manager so we can better support and, and manage both of those entities. Do you happen to know if that's what the other high schools do? They do. They have farm managers, and, yes. Mm -hmm. And then additionally, I, I just have question marks again, as we continue to increase enrollment, you already see our, our students with special needs. We have to always focus on that support staff, supporting our students, and also administrative support, whether that is clerical support, whether that is support in the White House within the, the business office. Uh, more students means more billing, which just, it's, it's an endless domino effect when we have more students and more staff. I just want to share sort of a checklist of Projects that we've, we've completed over the last several years, this will help justify a reduction of one particular line in the budget, which we never want to reduce. But I just want to verify that we have accomplished a lot, which makes us reducing this particular line less painful. It's still painful. So you can, I'm not going to go through, but it's a laundry list of projects that we've completed over the last few years. You see so many completed. Okay? In progress, updating the chop lockers. We are 80%, 90% done with that particular project. Our hope is to finish that within the next year. Uh, so then every single vocational program will have all new lockers within their locker room area. Again, the list goes on. We are still in progress, just trying to, from the marketing, branding standpoint, okay, we have school colors of black and gold. And if you walk this campus, the colors were different depending on what building you're in, perhaps what, what hallway you're in. You know, we want to have a, a school-wide branding of, you know, we are truly Smith. No matter where you are on campus, we are Smith. Uh, so we're working on that brand across campus. Uh, the automated door control system, okay, this is in progress. We talked about that earlier in the meeting. The sidewalk upgrades, we've talked about that earlier. That's, that's moving along. Uh, the painting of the barns, that's, again, part of the vision. We want to make sure that, you know, when you drive along Route 9, that now that all those trees are down, and you look up on a hill, and you see a beautiful ag complex. Uh, that's our goal. Um, the bushes has been a request uh, that's still on the table. The expanded animal science complex we've been talking about for the last how many years now. Uh, we're working on that. And again, then we get into the big ones. Uh, new D building, perhaps a new building in general. 
we get to that level, we're talking about a governance model. And if those are bigger discussions, but they are on the list. The school-based health center, that is back off the map, okay? There's movement, there's discussions uh, from the Hilltown Health Network. Again, this has no direct bearing on our budget, but it's out there uh, as an impact on the school. The horticulture building, you know the status there. In the North Hampton Animal, Animal Control Facility, I'll say it's in progress. So, uh, that's moving along. What's the difference between new D building and new building in general? Depending on the, the perspective, can we get away with simply a new D building and maintaining the other buildings? Uh, compared to, there are people who would feel let's just knock down all the buildings and build one massive one building. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of which way do we go? Mm -hmm. Just as a to make all of you sort of choke, um, there's a regional vote tech up in Haverhill, Mass. Their first letter of the name is a W. <clears throat> they are in the MSBA pipeline. They've been approved. Um, for a three building, a three story building in the shape of a W. And uh, the cost, the estimate was $422 million. Um, so, no issue for the taxpayers in the city of Northampton. We'll mm -hmm. get on that. Um, so, the point is the costs are through the roof. Uh, what can we do to upgrade our, our, our campus, support our students in the 21st century without costing $422 million? What does MSBA reimburse? It depends on the community, but 50, 60 percent, somewhere there. But uh, if when we were at the conference, they talked about the, the funding process and what they're actually funding. You know, it's what, 75 percent, if they're lucky. Right. So if they're, fu if they're reimbursing at the 50 to 60 percent, right. unfortunately what's happening is what we're seeing now with the construction of the horticulture building. They're funding, they're reimbursing that, but then the costs are going through the roof. Right. It's, it's an issue. So now let's focus on the animal science complex, break that down a little bit. Uh, again, just to get the board sort of a vision of, of where we're at. The former GCC building, we're calling that the animal science building. Uh, it's going to provide us two classrooms. It's going to provide us a locker room, instructor space. Our goal is to move our students in when we come back from the break. So that project is almost done. The MS Barn has a classroom. Our goal is to turn that classroom into our pocket pet lab. That's your guinea pigs and rabbits and gerbils and all those fun animals. Uh, we're also going to have an egg production facility over there. Uh, as you know, we, we are selling eggs with our chicken unit. Uh, right now, the, the vision is that that facility is where the current locker room is. So once the lockers are moved to the new building, we'll have space to then have the egg production facility. Now uh, we're looking at a new animal quarantine area, most likely in the current uh, office space with our farm techs. Uh, there'll be a slight little addition we can have a place because as the new animals come in, they have to be quarantined uh, just for, for safety and security purposes. We are hoping once the students move into that new animal science building that will open up that current classroom, we can begin to demo and renovate into that pocket pet lab. Uh, so that's the status of that part of the expansion. And as I already mentioned earlier in the meeting, the nursery barn uh, will become that dog grooming and boarding area. Uh, the vision there would be as a, a staff benefit. Uh, there would be some type of schedule set up by the animal science instructors where staff would be allowed to bring in their dogs for the day, have them kenneled, have them groomed, and, and uh, babied throughout the school day. The goal, as you already heard, during April vacation, the current pig barn would come down, and then hopefully construction over the summer. Continue on. Many, many moving pieces. The dairy barn. We need to do some renovations down below of the dairy barn. So uh, when we have a new round of pigs, they have a place to live, okay? Because right now, the pigs live in the pig barn. Uh, they're going away, which is allowing us to take that pig barn down. But the next time we need pigs, we need a new place for them to live. <laughs> we'll be eating them soon. Uh, the horticulture building, uh, we've been talking about this since June, July. Uh, it's going to provide a much more efficient learning area for our, our students and staff. It, it is going to provide an additional classroom from what we already have, uh, so that's going to support not only horticulture, but potentially also animal science. Uh, we already mentioned that we're in the midst of hiring the OPM finally, and then the next phase is going out for the design phase, finalizing that design, bidding the, the construction contractor, downwing, breaking ground, building. It's a long process. Uh, I unfortunately was sort of the bearer of bad news during the subcommittee meeting. During the interviews with the OPM, uh, current projects out there, there is some electrical equipment 
that we need a quarter. Quarter for that particular project is a 62 week, 62 week wait for that particular equipment. So we're talking about a year simply to wait for the parks. Garage doors are in the 40 week wait period. And as a shop, we will have garage doors. So uh, this is going to unfortunately be a process. So the sooner we get moving, the sooner we can begin to wait for our garage doors. <laughs> uh, so anyways, that's the status of that horticulture bill. You've already seen this. Uh, this is that financial outlook I've been sharing with the board. Again, right now, we are approximately just north of $6 million that we have uh, earmarked. One side note, the economic bond bill, uh, the amendment from Senator Cumberford is officially approved. Uh, we have that coming to us, uh, so that's great. Uh, again, early estimate for the building was $7.4 million. That included about a million dollars worth of contingency fees. If we could save some, we're still going to be we're short. And then we're $400 million to a $1 million short, or $1.4 million short. Uh, and back to Dr. Spencer Robinson, your question, like, how do we build a building if we don't have the money yet? Well, we can't. So we have to figure this out. That's that next phase. You already saw this slide. Okay, I just wanted to highlight again the work that we've done internally to raise uh, money through uh, the grants. And that was $7.7 .7 million in skills capital grants over this past calendar year. Uh, without that money, we aren't talking this evening about much of anything. Mm -hmm. Now let's talk about the fun stuff, which is the numbers. Okay. <clears throat> Our budget is driven by non-resident tuition. This is a five-year trend of our tuition rates. And right now, the unofficial number this year is $19,921,000 per non-resident student. That's an increase of 1.52% over this current fiscal year. The average of these five years is <coughs> about a 2.91% increase. So that means our budget should be increasing 1.52%. If our students stay <coughs> Right. Yeah. That, if, if we weren't expecting any more non-resident students, yes, the overall budget should increase about that. What percent of what proportion <coughs> of our budget is non-resident? About 80%. Overall budget, and again, this is tentative. Uh, I'm not asking for an official approval tonight, but it's just a five-year quick trend. Uh, what we're looking at right now is a budget for this coming year in the, in the $13.3 million range. Okay, that's everything. That's a slight increase. It's a 4.41% increase over the current fiscal year. So again, great question. If the overall budget is going up 4.41%, but our non-resident tuition is only going up 1.52%, what's going on there? Okay. Well, what's going on there? Again, it's going up 1.52%, our non-resident tuition rate. We are anticipating an increase of non-resident students of a plus 18. That is getting very tight, I'll, I'll be honest. Okay, That was not a number that Joe and Crystal first came to me uh, when they presented the budget to me. Uh, it was a lower number, that, which meant the deficit was greater. I felt comfortable uh, getting a, a plus 18 over the current year. That gives us a small buffer <clears throat> to make sure we can pay our transportation contracts so the Northampton students have a ride to school. And uh, it ensures that we have a little bit of money, perhaps, going into the tuition revolving account. Again, that tuition revolving account is essential for us with all of the projects that we have going on. So we can't exhaust that account. But right now, what we're looking at is increasing 18 students, non-resident students. So back to the, what we were just talking about a, a moment ago. A reminder, that four-year enrollment trend. In two years, we hit 600 students. If we, if we continue to say 600 students are a max, we don't want to go beyond 600 students, what would happen if that was this year? If we said we're at capacity, we're not going to go any higher, our budget would increase 1.6% this year. It would not be the 4.41%. The point is, 4.41%, that increases because we're bringing in more students. If we don't bring in more students, our budget goes up 1.6%. Which means we're laying people off. Or closing programs, closing programs, which is laying people off. Okay. So that's a just a future forecast. That's not this year. I just want the board to understand. Once we hit that ca capacity in quotation marks of 600 students, that's going to drive a discussion that we have to have of how do we then sustain what we we've got going on. Can you go back to 
to the um, slides that show the pre and thank you for including this um, that historical perspective. It's helpful to see. Which one do you want? Um, <coughs> no, the one, the table that you have. Oh, okay. Yeah. So fiscal year 20, a little less than three percent increase, 21 seven percent, back to four, up to eight, down to four and a half. Can you explain that a little yep. bit? Yep. So there's a trend that's happening over these last five years. There was a bump here, a relatively decent sized bump in tuition, and then it almost flatlined. And then there was a substantial bump, and then it's basically flatlined. So that is, again, back to driving the budget. So on when the state had truly increased non-resident tuition in that year and in this year, you see the direct reflection of a seven point and an eight. And again, not only is our non-resident tuition rate jumping in those two years, our enrollment has continued to, to increase. So we were getting a, a double positive there. Right. And what, um, how much have we received in SRF funding in and in which years <coughs> fall? You know that? SRF three is 700, 763,000. Yeah. And um, SRF two. What, what was SRF three? The third, the last one. The one we're in. Yeah, we're going backwards. And SRF two, we're at 350,000, somewhere around Yeah. SRF one, 350. So not, but the, that was at the total amount that we we received. Okay, so that's not it's good. So our three is the biggest. And what was your one about? So it's less. Yeah, yeah it was really low. It's really low. It's like wow. eighty maybe. <coughs> Seventy nine. Yeah, correct. Correct. Quite a lot. Correct. It's, it's like total a million probably. They changed their formula. Federal government. Gotcha. So that that would be that's in fiscal year twenty three. Where it says increase of 973 if our SR was 750. SR was not part of this. That's not part of it. No. It's not part of our budget? Not in these calculations. This is the budget number that we give to the mayor to get to the city. That does not include the SR money. Okay. That's not what city council would vote on for the specification of budget. Oh, gotcha. And SR is multi year. Yeah, yeah, got it. Okay. And it's a great. Okay. Thank you. So again, I just want to highlight the fact that that 4.41% increase is because it increased our enrollment. Okay? Yes. Uh, I want to thank the mayor okay, for uh, above net school spending, which is the bare minimum that Northampton has to provide for the Smith Vocational, the same thing for NTS. Uh, the mayor has promised 4% over the current fiscal year above and beyond net school spending. Uh, so that is also included. <clears throat> A couple of recommendations, and I, I share this as looking at a budget that we're very tight, and we have to begin to look at what do we do. Uh, and again, to be overly simplified, when we deal with the school budget or we deal with the home budget, uh, you have two ways to make a budget work. One is you increase revenue. At home, that means work overtime or find a second job. Uh, or you cut your expenses. You don't go to the movies as often. Uh, so I've already authorized Joe and Crystal to let's increase revenue by budgeting at a higher number of non-resident students. It's very easy for me to just, oh, let's just bring in more students. But again, the, the, the downfall, if we overestimate, okay, and we can't follow through and get that number of students, then the onus falls on the city. And we can't do that to the city. So uh, we can only budget the number of students that we truly can anticipate coming here to Smith. Uh, so that plus 18, I would recommend the solution to solve our problem is not to go to 19 or 20 or 21. We should not just keep increasing, okay? Uh, so I have to start looking at how do we save some money, okay? Uh, one is the MTRS. For those who are not familiar with MTRS, that's the Massachusetts Teacher Retirement System, okay? Uh, this is a practice that has been in place way before any of us. Uh, this was a former, former HR coordinator that we had here at the school. Uh, she used to work within the city. She then transferred to Smith, and part of that agreement was she would continue to do uh, MTRS, MTRS. The schools are required to submit monthly reports to MTRS. We do that internally for the Smith vocational staff. <clears throat> we also do that for NPS. You heard me correctly. So our staff completes all of the monthly reporting for MTRS for all of Northampton Public Schools. I simply talk about maybe there should be a discussion that maybe we get a credit on the Schedule 19, an offset from MPS to offset our efforts. Uh, we had a meeting, previous administration, I know you're looking at me kind of funny, uh, <laughs> about 
not this mayor's issue. Previous mayor uh, met with myself, met with um, Dr. Uh, Provost, <coughs> talking about all of this, and uh, I said we can't continue this practice. Okay, we just can't keep up. Uh, Dr. Provost said he couldn't afford hiring his own person. We talked about maybe consolidating down in the city. Uh, but that would be a major benefit loss for our staff, and we advocated to keep who we had here, uh, so we've continued to keep this going. So I just I share this as a discussion within the board that uh, perhaps that's something we have to now look at with the new administration, at the school level, at the city level. Perhaps there's a way, uh, if we're going to continue this, that we skip through. In Schedule 19 is where we track all the indirect yeah. costs of the related program. to the city. Correct. Yep. So you're proposing adding that to the list. And that list was negotiated by you and Crystal. And it voted on by the board, yeah. honestly. But like the people who know yes. all those numbers and the expenses and the numbers, <coughs> they all came up with this list. And it's justified. There's nobody arguing yeah. Schedule 19. It's it's a great document. Right. It's so fair. So this is just saying, let's modify just it. Tweak it a little bit. Yeah. Thank you. The second one, oops. I'm just throwing this out there as another, perhaps, discussion point. Uh, rightly so, I fully support the stormwater drainage uh, expense across the city. Uh, the city has to handle all the stormwater across the city, and everybody gets billed for it. That's fine. My only question as perhaps a discussion topic. Uh, now, we've talked about the stormwater drainage issue that we're trying to help uh, with the Route 9 issue. Uh, if that, some of that stormwater is coming back through our pasture, is there a way to perhaps get any type of credit on our bill? It's separate from Schedule 19. Okay, this particular expense is not within the Schedule 19. This is a direct cost. It's a direct bill, like our electric bill, as an example. Mm -hmm. Correct. Uh, I would just simply advocate to the board that perhaps we, we talk to the city uh, that is there a way to, to receive some type of credit because some of this warm water is coming back through the pasture. You know, would that alleviate some of the concerns that the board has raised uh, recently? I put that out there. Staffing priorities. <clears throat> I've already mentioned assistant principal. Again, question is, there's no space on campus to put an assistant principal. Uh, so what is the vision here? The recommendation is that in the main office, we have the principal, we have the assistant principal, we have the vocational director. The proposal is that the two assistant principals are housed in the main office with the principal. It makes total sense. When you think about student behavior, go to the office. You go to the office, you can handle either, either assistant principal would be there. The recommendation is that the vocational director moves out and moves into the athletic director's office. Uh, Mr. Leroux right now, his office is in B building, really in the heart of a lot of the vocational programs. It would make a lot of sense that the vocational director is there. Curriculum director is in C building right now, really in the heart of the academic area. It would make sense that the vocational director is in the heart of the vocational programs. And then we would renovate, there's a closet, it would be a glorified closet once we're done, uh, but we would renovate a closet and uh, the athletic director would move in there. It's actually within the gymnasium. Uh, and sort of the vision would be it's a double set of doors, perhaps we have one door, the other door could be sort of framed in with a, a window of some sort. So Mr. Leroux, he's at basketball games, as he mentioned this past winter season, he could actually be in his office maybe doing some work, observing the games. It makes a lot of sense on many, on many levels. So that would be the proposal. Again, if and when the budget is approved, if we support an assistant principal, that's how we would house that assistant principal. Also in our draft budget, we are recommending a level <coughs> level funding of supplies and materials. I just want to remind the staff what that truly means. Somebody may say, that sounds good, you're level funding supplies and materials. But whatever you level fund is different than level services. Level funding means same dollar amount. In order to make this budget work, that's what we're recommending. But cost of material and, and supplies are going through the roof. So if we're giving shops the same amount of money, that means they're going to be getting less material. That's the bottom line. Extraordinary maintenance. This is that line I mentioned a while ago when I gave you that laundry list of projects that have been completed over the last several years. Uh, the recommendation that we reduce that particular line by just over $61,000. We bring it down to, I think it's about $25,000, I believe. They have been budgeted well over $100,000 over the last few years, and then last year we had to reduce it. And then uh, again, this year we're recommending another reduction. It should be budget low lines. <laughs> okay. NEAC, every 10 years is a big accreditation. This coming year is that, that cycle, it's that year. So we have to increase that budget line by over $6,000 so we can go through that, that accreditation process. So there's an increase in that particular line. Uh, when you get the budget in front of you, you'll see that within the superintendent's 
category. <clears throat> Utilities. All of you have electric bills at home, you know it's going through the roof. Uh, Smith Vocational is not uh, excluded from increased electrical costs. Right now, utilities, looking at actuals, we're looking at an anticipated increase of 21% for utilities. Back to overall budget is going up 4.41%. Back to one, once we hit 600, that budget may only go up whatever the rate is of non-resident tuition. We cannot sustain ourselves if utilities continue to go up at that rate. Can't have. Have we ever considered solar? We have. So a few years ago, uh, actually through MAVA, we had a summer retreat. We had an outside vendor come in and present it to MAVA. Uh, we invited that contractor to come and speak to us. There are different options that we could look at. We have a solar array already uh, down at the Bill former tennis courts, which provides some credit, but even with that, we're still looking at an increase of 21%. Yeah. Are there ways to increase our solar footprint? I think there are ways. We can look at it if the board felt we needed to pursue that. So. Mm -hmm. A lot of households have done that. Right. Building maintenance. Another 16% increase we're looking at. Why such an increase? Two reasons. Back to materials so expensive nowadays. Okay, To fix anything is going to cost more money. And we're in aging buildings across campus. And we have multiple boilers, and we have multiple of everything. Uh, so back to Dr. Spencer Robertson asked why we're looking at a D building or one building. The supporters of one building would say we could save on maintenance because you only have one heating system, one cooling system. It's, it's just more efficient that way. Uh, but how do we finance that up front? Yeah, exactly. Uh, so we're anticipating a 16% increase just simply in this. So again, bottom line, we're looking at a deficit of approximately fifty to sixty thousand dollars. I want to hammer home with that though. This could be a lot worse. A lot, 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 lot worse. Uh, just pick up the newspaper, read school committee meetings going on right now across the state. Uh, unfortunately, for a lot of school committees, uh, their school administration and their school committees took all the ESSA money that we talked about. They're, they're pumping ESSA money into increasing staff. Uh, so we had an increased staff, increased staff, increased staff. How do you afford that? We afford that through ESSA money. Well, the ESSA money is now drying up. And the school departments want to maintain that staffing. So it's that fiscal cliff that we keep talking about. Uh, we're not facing that fiscal cliff because as we increase staff, we were automatically trying to get them into the operating budget from the get-go. Uh, a lot of the ESSA money that we had uh, went into uh, really to supporting the infrastructure of the school was technology. Uh, how, much, how many uh, new computers, new iPads, new laptops, Chromebooks, or whatever, that we purchased over the last few years, which is allowing, if you get into the technology budget, we're actually not increasing the technology budget much because we've already invested in technology. So I think it was very wise of the school and the board that we focus that money in those one-time improvements for the school, and not in the personnel. We were able to absorb the personnel in the operating budget. So that's why if you want to deem a fifty to sixty thousand dollar deficit as a cliff, I would argue it's sort of a dip. It's not quite a cliff. Uh, we will find somehow we will find that that gap. We'll close that gap. Uh, but we're not talking hundreds of thousands of dollars like a lot of school departments are looking at. So I just want to share that. But my point is again, I just want to open up to the board. I might get into the weeds tonight, okay? But you see some high level issues, okay? Uh, if you have priorities that do what you want us to truly protect, or are there areas where you say, Andy, if you have to cut some place, cut in this area, uh, I am open to the ideas. But with that said, my presentation is done. Thank you. Here it is. <laughs> Avoiding the conversation as you're up. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, I had to take a phone call. <clears throat> well, we'll start with uh, Mandy as usual. Hi. 
Um, for clubs, we have student government. They're planning the spring spring events that we held for April break, break. And then uh, fundraisers, where a few uh, criminal justice is having the annual pasta dinner, April seventh in the cafeteria. Money will go to uh, help with criminal justice student uniforms, fellowships, and events. Student government is having a pie eating contest as part of the spring spirit events and mem uh, members of the Smith community. And money will help cause the future student government events and contributions to scholarships. Making Greenstone advertising campaign. Students and staff are selling advertisements to be published in the spring 2023 edition. And money will money raised will help support publishing costs. And then in art, we have a student, Josie Dubai. Um, she won the Sophie Key Award for her drawing a Mesh Society in the National Scholastic Art and Writing Competition. Wow. That is all I have. Thank you, Mandy. Um, and as you can see in front of you, uh, for admissions, we are at 305 applications right now, 59 or 19.3 percent from Northampton. So that's an increase of 50 applications over last year at this time, a steady increase since 2019. Uh, our trimester two has ended, and we're going to begin going through the grade verification process, and we expect the report cards will be shared out electronically uh, next Thursday. Uh, we did have some hires that we were able to do, so we hired an electrical instructor, Ray Racine. Uh, he'll be starting on May 1st, very lucky there. Uh, also lucky to hire an agricultural mechanics instructor, Dan Kelly. He'll be starting on Monday. Uh, and as you know, he'll be replacing um, Steph Ripish in Ag Mech, who is going to transition over as the uh, third animal science instructor. Uh, and we'll do a, a steady... Uh, predictable transition to make sure that those two new instructors in AgMEC are supported through the end of the year. Uh, so she's going to phase out of AgMEC uh, and into animal science by the end of the year. She'll also stay on as the department head through the end of the year. Uh, and she'll manage the grant that we receive all through next year. Uh, so she's really stepped up. We appreciate it. We were also able to hire another uh, social worker to replace the resignation. Uh, and we want to welcome Jessica Ayala. Uh, she started actually yesterday. Uh, Skills USA district results came in, and we had five gold medalists: Marin Friedman, Madison Gorell, Madeline Lampke, Taylor Beckman, and Dane Radwich. We had seven silver winners: Keith Cable, Megan Courtney, Emery Karen, Jessica Craig, Gabriel Chambers, Juliana Santos, Trevor Lemoyne, and seven bronze: Ivan Fario Caballero, Miles Alberts. Catherine Costa, Aiden Nugent, Riley Miller. Uh, Riley is the son of our animal science vocational assistant, uh, Diane Miller, and Seth Ostrowski, and Dominic Grosher. So pending your questions, that's my report for this evening. Question. Yes. Back to personnel, Joe. Um, these <coughs> hires are essentially replacing people that are leaving? Yep, so we had um, Chris Kelly left electrical January 3rd to take the vocational director's job at Dean Tech. Uh, so Ray is coming in to replace him. Okay. AgMech is the one replacing uh, Stephanie, so she'll make that transition as the third animal science. And our uh, part-time social worker resigned. Uh, she needed to take care of the child, child care. Okay, so we're not adding additional staff. For no, these are, these are for earlier reported yep. resignations. Okay. Um, I don't know where to bring this up, but there was a uh, last board meeting. I introduced the possible need of taking the grant writing off of admin and bringing in a grant writer, uh, maybe also a capital campaign fundraiser person. Um, so I just wanted to keep that on the table at some point in the discussion. Yeah, so right now that's still front burner and in the <coughs> budget that we're working on right now is still in the budget as a full-time position. Great. Currently. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Under new business, may I have a motion a second to approve <coughs> one day out of state field trip to New York City to visit the Statue of Liberty, Ellis Island, and 911 Memorial Museum for 12th grade students and criminal justice. The date to be determined. So moved. So moved. Can I go? No. <laughs> Is there any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. 
I have a motion to second to approve one day out of state field trip to New York City for an organized food <coughs> tour, May 5th, 2023, for 12th grade students in culinary arts. So moved. Yeah, I want to put that one too. <laughs> second. The mayor's going. Is there any further discussion? Just All appreciation to the teachers for uh, chaperoning these field trips. It's a lot. They sound fun and they are, but it's a lot of work and a lot of yeah. responsibility for the teachers. So appreciate that they're giving students the opportunity. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any further discussion on that? All in favor? Aye. Aye. We have a motion and a second to approve payment of an FY22 invoice to O'Neill Consulting for $1,378.80 E-rate funding from tuition involvement. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 We have a motion and a second to approve an additional in-kind $20,000 donation for Skills Capital Grant Animal Science. Uh, can we elaborate on that? What? We've got to move first. So moved. Second. Further discussion? Yep. So, and I can yep. look at any of the above individuals, but basically, just as a reminder, I'll give the, the base, and I'll turn it over to Tim or Crystal or Joe. Uh, as a reminder, the skills capital grants, not only are they reimbursable grants, meaning we have to upfront the cost, get reimbursed. The second component uh, is to receive in-kind donations. Uh, that's also a requirement of the grants. Our charge at providing the grants is to figure out how much in-kind can we afford and what particular projects can we cover through the in-kind donations. We do the best that we can at that point before the project even begins to say, what do we need? And we bring some, we get quotes, and we, we come up with a, the best guesstimate we can. Uh, unfortunately, our best guesstimate in this gigantic project uh, wasn't enough, honestly, uh, which is why we're asking for the additional 20000 which in, includes, uh, if Tim, you want to elaborate on what some of the additional costs are? Yep, uh, so we had Kevin Reardon from uh, uh, Dietz give us a code compliance for our renovation, so we had an idea where we had to hit it. Um, uh, Wick came in and cut holes in the wall for the new doors going outside. Uh, pretty much we just, the constant uh, material list that has gone up and now we're trying to furnish some of the stuff in the classrooms. And we still need to get the epoxy flooring and the fire alarm system put in. Okay, so <clears throat> essentially you do your best to earmark what you can in kind and be an in kind in house through the school. Correct. And so now we need to come up with an additional 20, which will come from the tuition we Okay. Thank you. Thank you. A stabilization fund. Yes. Now that we've had further discussion, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Paul Harvey says, page two. Uh, may I have a motion and a second to approve the 23 24 school calendar? So moved. Second. Did we get a copy of the calendar? Yeah, it should be easy. It should be easy. It's in the packet. It wasn't emailed to you. Okay, got it. <coughs> so it's, is it the staple? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
And then contractually, that Friday, uh, which is September uh, 1st, uh, would be the, in, the, in the contract that says that Friday going into Labor Day is a, a non-school day for staff. So that would remain, it would be a, a long uh, Labor Day weekend holiday for the staff. So that's sort of the beginning. Uh, the reason this is outside the contract, starting on the 24th is outside the, con the contractual start date for the staff according to the contract, which is why we vote on both sides. Mm -hmm. Fast forward uh, into June. Uh, that means currently with no snow days, day 180 would be on June 12th. And if we uh, have a, a heavy winter and experience five snow days, it would be June 20th. Uh, on June 20th would obviously mean we would be recognizing uh, June 19th as Juneteenth as a, a non-school day, uh, which would make day 180, in reality 185, would be up on the 20th. Uh, otherwise, uh, the typical holidays, the breaks uh, are all consistent. Uh, just a side note, the December break uh, is actually, it would ex we would experience the same days off this coming year uh, as we experienced this year. And that's just how we recognize and observe Christmas Eve and Christmas uh, within the city. Mm -hmm. uh, but really the highlight was the start dates and then obviously how that impacts June. So with that, I'll turn it back over. Is there any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. <clears throat> May I have a motion a second to approve the city's standard annual longevity for all non-representative employees retroactive to July 1st, 2022. So moved. Second. Do you want to talk to that? Yes, please. please. Okay. Um, so at our last board meeting, we voted to refer the proposal for longevity benefits for non-represented employees to the negotiation subcommittee because it was a little bit complicated. Um, it's still a little bit complicated. Um, first, there's some support employees who are eligible for longevity who do not currently receive it, and that's what we will vote on tonight. Second, we learned that longevity benefits um, that our support employees receive are the same rate that other city employees receive, including the support employees in the Northampton Public Schools. Um, so at our negotiation subcommittee meeting, we decided to look more closely at the overall pay scale for our support employees. Uh, including the value of the cost of living and step increases that were recently awarded. And our subcommittee will meet again and return to the full board with another proposal if we believe it is warranted. So in, in a nutshell, the impact um, for this motion, again, the recommendations are retroactive for this year. What we're specifically looking at are the paraprofessionals and the vocational assistants. Uh, right now, do not receive longevity. They're the only job categories here at the school uh, minus the superintendent, that receive longevity, or don't receive longevity. So what you're voting on here would be for the paraprofessionals and the vocational assistants to receive the same longevity per the city policy. So. And during the subcommittee meeting, it was brought out that not only are we taking care of these people that are employees, but we're also putting a benefit out there for future employees that we're going to be hiring. So in regards to bringing them into to the school as a benefit, we felt it's definitely warranted, and that's why we brought it forward. <coughs> so, okay. Any further discussion? Can I just clarify. So this would be matching what the city does for non-represented employees. Correct. And have you already talked about what those levels are? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just wanted to make sure you all knew what they were. Okay. Thank you. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. May I have a motion and a second to surplus fresh eggs for donation to the 4-H food group at the Blue Ribbon Cafe. So, oh, second. Any further discussion? Yeah, what is the Blue Ribbon Cafe sale? <laughs> Don't ask. <laughs> okay. Is there any any further discussion? I mean, do you, do you know it's, a uh, it, it's just a calf sale down in, uh, at the Big E uh, that the 4-H groups are involved in. Kids raising. Food boot, the 4-H food boot is always the best. Our okay. eggs are going south. Mm -hmm. okay. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. We have a motion a second to approve to surplus for disposal the stage curtain in representation flags of the world countries. So moved. So moved. Second. 
for the discussion. Where are they going? Uh, Officially? The trash. Okay. If they're flagged, they should go to the VFW to be disposed of. The U.S. flags will be guarding them. Correct. Thank you. Further discussion? <coughs> if none, all in favor? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. So the new ones are up and we'll see them tomorrow? The currents are up, correct. Awesome. Future business. April 11th, 2023, regular board of trustees meeting. We may have one on the 4th. I would recommend the 4th if the board's yeah. okay with that. So we'll, more to follow. May 16th. Uh, 2023 regular board of trustees for number five here in the library. Um, Upcoming events March 22nd, 2023 program advisory committee dinners and meetings, which is tomorrow. tomorrow. <coughs> April 4th through 6th, the 2023 FFA state convention will be held at the Sheridan Framingham Hotel and Conference Center. <coughs> uh, April 13th. 2023 mob outstanding vocational student awards banquet mechanics hall in Worcester. Uh, at this time, I'd like to move into executive session to enter into executive session under Massachusetts General Law, Open Meeting Law 30A, Section 21A2, to conduct collective bargaining with Unit H and to reconvening convene an open session from up to the lab. Mr. Chairman, yes. before we move forward, um, the property subcommittee meetings has been meeting before this at 3 o'clock. Um, I don't know if it makes sense to maybe move it to 4, seeing we've kind of gotten a good routine down and consolidate things, or does it make sense to leave it at 3 for staff reasons, or I don't know. I'm just throwing it out there. So you're recommending that? I'm just throwing it out there as a discussion. I, today we move very quickly. We were done in a half hour because we're better prepared. We better know what's going on. We've got highlighted all our issues um, until instead of we have the meeting at 3 and then there's a big gap, does it make sense to do it at 4 and move right into this meeting? The only thing I would object to is that if it ran long, it's yep. going to impact the 5 o'clock meeting. I would rather keep it that Okay. Time. And if we have to take a break, we take a break. So be it. Thank you. Okay, so I need to have a second to go into executive. Or are you going to do a roll call then? We have a second. We need a second. Second. Yeah. Okay. And then now I'll do a roll call. Mr. Kaley? Present. Say yes. Yes. Dr. Spencer Robinson? Yes. Mr. Quadro? Yes. Mayor Sierra? Yes.